Alan Kay has said that perspective is worth 80 IQ points. I'm pretty sure that's why you're here. You want us speakers to inspire you, entertain you, and hopefully shift your perspective so that you can figure out what's coming next. No pressure. <laughs> but the obvious thing to do is to look backwards into the past and see the simple pattern that things have been getting smaller and faster and cheaper, and then take that simple rule and apply it to the future. I can tell you what's coming next. It's obvious, right? It's the iWatch, soon to be followed by the eye ring and the eye tie tack. <laughs> but really disruptive things are never the obvious things that you predict. Most of the time, the disruptive things are things that you have been staring at for a while and you didn't think were very important. So what actually have we been seeing? We've been seeing things like the Nest, which by the way, when it first came out, was considered to be a bit of a weird thing and now it's considered to be kind of cool, kind of a sign of a disruptive thing. And then we've seen strange things like the Twine sensor or the Vitelli Glow Cap, a smart pill bottle that will call your phone if you forget to take your pills. Or there's about a dozen smart light bulbs out there. Everybody likes to do smart light bulbs right now. And these aren't right, quite fitting the pattern. They're a bit weird, they're a bit odd. And then you throw in like the uh, smart city and then all hell breaks loose. And like things are not making sense. This is not the eye anything, right? This is kind of this weird mixture and we're not quite sure what's happening and we're a little confused. Now, Marshall McLuhan has a lovely quote for this. We look at the present through a rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. We look to the past to see something that's obvious and we walk backwards into it and then stumble. We stumble our way into the future, but that's not a criticism, that's just how we work. And we need to understand that's what we kind of do. So how do we look backwards? We see the world so simply as a device and a person. Now that device has changed quite a bit over the years. As a designer, I've been kept very busy keeping up with touch technology. But the world has got a little bit more interesting. It started off about being about the web as a small thing, but the web became its own more interesting thing. And this triangle became quite interesting. Because initially we were thrilled that we could get our email at home and at work. But then the web became more subtle, more interesting things were happening. And then on the other corner, it wasn't just me, it was my friends and my coworkers and my family. And then of course, it wasn't just my devices, it was all my devices, all my devices. And it's become a rather interesting, crazy, nuanced thing that's hard to easily quantify. But how do we think about this wonderful thing? Like this, a device and a person. So let's just go back and take a look at it in this triangular view and look at it because something interesting is happening. We are basically talking to the cloud through the browser for the most part. But when we talk to smart devices, at least today, we're talking through native applications and that's for good reason because the web can't talk to a nest right now. There is no choice but to do it that way. But if we believe in Moore's law at all, we'll have a smart device today, a couple more next year, maybe 10 in three years, and then, of course, in a few more years, we'll have hundreds if not thousands, not just in our homes, that's the current hotness, or at work, but possibly in public places. And this idea that we're going to take what's happened over the last year or two with native applications and apply that to the future in assuming that every smart device we will ever use requires an app becomes downright quaint. We've seen this before. Yahoo originally thought back in the 1990s that you could have a link to every website on the internet kind of cute if you think about it. it. You had to click your way to a bunch of links. People forget that the H in Yahoo stands for hierarchical. But then along came Google and said screw that and had a search box. You just typed it in and then they ranked the results. We know that hierarchy starts to break down in an exponential curve. The superpower of the web is interaction on demand. You can walk up to any device and use it with any other device. It's kind of a use it and lose it approach. But what have we been thinking about? How do we talk about the web right now? We talk about this magic window, the DOM, and it's gotten pretty cool. It can do some pretty cool things, but what do we put on top of it? We put this little text bar on top, this bar that we have to type into to go to the next web app. We've taken the most amazing rendering engine on the planet and slapped a DOS prompt on top of it. <laughs> what is up with that? Every native app on the planet tries desperately hard to figure out how to use the sensors in the phone. Why can't the web do that? Why can't we take a look at everything that's around us, grab it together, send it up to the cloud to do a quick sort, 
and bring it back down to you to see what are the first more li most likely things you'd be interested in doing. It's like Googling your room, but using proximity and not keywords. Now let's just walk you through a quick example of how this would work. I'm using a phone because we're comfortable with it, but it could be used by any new, smart, newfangled, cool thing, right? The idea is that today, you would pull down the notification bar and see an SMS or an alarm or something like that. Instead, you'd pull it down and you'd see your car in the driveway. I could see my wife through her phone or my stereo system. And when I clicked on them, it would just launch a browser. And I don't care what it does, it's just the browser. It's just about finding and discovering and taking me to those places. Now don't take my word for it, there are companies right now that are trying to crack this problem, but because they think in proprietary terms, it doesn't go very far. But they are trying it, and that's what's interesting. What I'm asking for is a series of devices that are broadcasting their URL, most likely using multiple technologies, I don't want to get into specifics now, but then a series of things that are looking it up, kind of creating a just-in-time ecosystem of interaction. Now the discovery part is just the first step. I need to talk about security, identity, data storage, and so forth, but I only have two minutes to go. Discovery is that first step. It's the step that unlocks everything else. If we don't get that, we don't get anything else to unlock and be able to walk up and use anything at any time. Yes, I'm a starry-eyed optimist. This is a little utopian. It kind of, we all have to kind of like link arms and sing kumbaya together. This, isn't really gonna happen in Silicon Valley very easily, but that's why I come out and talk at places like this. But let's talk about two simple things that might help. Let's take a look at FedEx. FedEx is a great company built on the free access to municipal roads. Great companies are built on great infrastructure. This makes things very simple. Ideas are either truck ideas or road ideas. The problem is that most new companies today try to be trucks, and that's okay if you're just flipping something quick, but when these trucks start getting big, they make their own toll roads and they like to sue people who use their toll roads. Things are getting a little out of whack. Does anyone know this man, Malcolm McLean? He is my hero. This man was the Steve Jobs of shipping in the 1960s. He invented the container ship, a universal device that could go from truck to train to boat, and he made a killing. And what did this guy do? He gave it all away. What was he, some kind of communist pinko? No, he was a hard-nosed business capitalist that realized he had a road idea. And the idea was that he didn't want to be in the trucking business, he wanted to be in the shipping business. And by giving it all away, he created a much bigger infrastructure, and he made even more money. Sometimes it pays to kind of give a little. What would you rather have? 75% of this little thing, or 25% of a really big thing? That's what that kind of thinking can give you. Now, I consult to Internet of Things startup companies. They get this, they want more road ideas, but their investors won't let them think about it or have the time. We have forgotten how the internet was built. It was originally built by a bunch of crazies who thought win-win. It was about raising the bar so that everybody could do something interesting. And yes, it's okay to have a proprietary system. It doesn't have to be completely communist. But the idea is to think a little bit broader and generate that next generation of thinking about where we need to go. When we think about the future, it's so easy to be blinded by the current hotness. Now, there's nothing wrong with the iPhone. I've got a lot of respect, respect for it. But the first step in any journey is knowing where you want to go. And the whole idea right now I'm talking about is this discovery service, a free and open service that we would build together so that every device could talk to every other device. Let's talk. Thank you.